Hello everybody, welcome to uh, Coffee Vlog, the show where I get on a comedian and we speak about life, comedy, movies and many other things. Uh, today on the show we have Emily McQuaid. Hiya. Uh, did you want to Did you want to introduce yourself? That's the, this one I normally do. Uh, my name's Emily McQuaid, I am a stand-up comedian and um, sometimes I'm a massive idiot. But that's This is more therapy than comedy, <laughs> isn't it? That's one of my catchphrases. More therapy yeah, than comedy? Yeah. I've actually had people say that to me after a show, which is worrying. What, that they, it was, it seemed like therapy, but... Yeah. Or they, or people, i.e. my mum, have gone, oh, I don't know how you make these things up. I'm like, that's true. <laughs> Gosh, that's, well, that's always good, though. That is always yeah, good. When they, yeah, when they... You've got such case. a vivid imagination. <laughs> Weird things. How, how did you get into comedy? Uh, well, I was a comedy obsessive when I was very, very young. I got to a certain, I think I was about, sort of, eight or nine and then I had my mum had like a there was like a Monty Python special on I think it was it would have been not long after Graham Chapman died so this would have been, been about 1986 I think and they showed like sort of a compilation of like best sketches and my mum was like watch this you're gonna really like this and was obviously it, was it the flying circus stuff or? it was some of the flying circus stuff yeah but it was like the really good stuff yeah, yeah. the whole cliche with flying circus is that only a small percentage of it is good which maybe I don't know it's certainly a little bit of a weird. I mean, do, do, have you... the first if you if you watch the it is a very the first season's I think a bit too obscure at one point. Yes, because you've got I don't know if you remember from the the first season where you just have the I can't remember who's running out of the water, but they're in the sea and they they're running towards the camera. For oh, eight. it's Michael Palin. Yeah, Michael yes. just walking towards yeah. the camera for ages. Yeah, and it's... it's just really it's not like what people think. My Monty Python is now. It's it's just it's, it's quite quite, quite arty. abstract and quite arty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was the really silly stuff that stuck with me. There was one point where there was a race where it was between Queen, uh, between a load of Queen Victorias. I can't remember if it was like Terry Jones dressed as Queen Victoria, but it was literally just, I love, I was just like, oh my God, there's grown ups being stupid. This is brilliant. I love this. I also really liked Upper Class Twit of the Year. So. <laughs> and then my mum also made me read George Orwell at a young age, so maybe that was a like, yeah. Class Consciousness book, which is quite ironic given how posh a lot of Monty Python were. But. Um, yeah, there was that. There was also Blackadder. There was sort of, yeah. and my my parents would veto certain episodes which I could watch. There was one with Rick Mail in. They were like, "I don't think you should watch that one." <laughs> You're like, oh. Well, it was. Did they think he was too much for? Yeah, they did. They did. Ignoring the fact that I was watching, he he did. Um, I don't know if you've seen George's Marvelous Medicine with Roald Dahl book on Jack and Nori. I remember watching that when I was a kid, and that was just amazing. And there was also a show he did called Grim Tales, which was him telling fairy stories, and it was like really proper weird animation. This was like early Channel Four, so everything was a little bit edgy and a bit punky. And a bit I'm sure it was, yeah, who was it? That, was it him doing the voice for Grim? Grim Tales. I don't know. He was like the storyteller. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. And he had a chair that had like ostrich legs on it. <laughs> it um, it's all on YouTube, so definitely worth um, worth checking out. But yeah, I I got I was a bit obsessed with that kind of thing, and I. I realised when I was about 14 that kind of, well, I'd always sort of told jokes and come up with like weird stuff. When I was about 14, that became a good way of, of making friends and also a way of dealing with bullies. So that just kind of became like a creative outlet. And it wasn't until years and years later when I was sort of attempting to write comedy stuff and not really having a way to go about it, I had someone say to me, well, why don't you give stand-up a go? I was like, oh, because it's scary. And they were like, think about it this way. There's not that much difference from being in the audience to being actually up behind the microphone. Which is ludicrous, <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, we had that's, a point. and we had, I had I had two beers by this point, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, so, what year did you start doing? Uh, well, I did my first gig probably the best part of a decade ago, but I stopped and started many times either due to one really really bad gig that made me just think I'm not doing this anymore, um, or there was for a while I was studying and working full time, and I was just like, no, can't do can't do everything. Um, but I, it was another writing course that got me back into it, actually. Um, I don't know whether he still does it, but Logan Murray, who does like the... I did his beginner's course yeah, back yeah. in the day, but he was doing a short writing course, and I did that, and I had some ideas, and people liked them, and then he was like, well, why don't you try these out? And I was like, no, sod it, I might as well go back to doing stand-up again. So I've kind of only really done it properly for like the past three years or so. Do you still in enjoy doing it? Mm. I think sometimes I enjoy it more now because it feels a little bit more familiar. Yeah. But it took me such a long time to kind of feel, oh, that sounds really stupid, but it always kind of like feel like I had permission to do it, that I was able to give myself permission to do it. Um, no, I get you. I get you there. Um, I, I normally ask her, 
if you tell people what, what's the type of style your your type um, of style of comedy that you do? Oh God, it's a bit weird. Um, a bit deadpan, a bit weird. I do a bit of observational stuff, but I always have to kind of re uh, kind of add. There's always some way, weird mention of animals somewhere in there. Um, yeah. And they um, had a bit with a mouse recently. Yeah. <laughs> I, my, well, that, that was part of the, I did a three-hander show with a couple of friends last year, which you, which you saw. Yeah. Um, there was a mouse in that, and um, there's going to be mice in my solo show, which I'm trying to write at the moment. Yeah, well, because <laughs> I see you've put in the description of your solo show the, uh, what's the, the shape of a... The yeah, the, the best shape for a mouse. Best shape for um, a mouse. The reason for that is that I get, for various reasons, I get obsessed with seeing mice on the underground. And there's the, in the show that I did last year... I told a story about a day when I was incredibly depressed, like sort of well, suicidally depressed, really. But what kind of kept me going was seeing a mouse kind of at Finsbury Park Station just pottering around. And I've realised, partly from paying more attention to mice on the tube and also from a, a lovely time recently when my office had a mouse infestation, uh, that mice vary a lot in shape and size. So it's just like, <laughs> literally, Laura, I'm going to come up with names for all the different mouse shapes. That's, that, that's, that sounds good. Yeah, because like baby mice are like little snowballs, and then like the long ones, I don't know. I'll come up with some. What, what, what type of mice is it you had in your work then? We had um, a little Disney snowball that was baby mouse, um, and like a longer mature mouse, which um, I don't know. I'm going to call that a long Marjorie just because I find the name Marjorie really funny, and I don't know why. Um, I do, I realised as well, mice seem to be this kind of weird recurring theme. I have a taxidermic mouse, which I taxidermied myself, and I can't <laughs> believe I'm talking about this now. I went on a course, I didn't just find a mouse and go, oh, let's see how I get on with this, but um, I think I might have to use a picture of him in the in the show. Um, now, he's a weird shape that you don't find in nature. He's shaped like a banana. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a... But it's because we... Because I'm not very good at sewing, but I wanted to get it done. Um, so I got so you just made in the shape of a. Yeah, of well, armor. it's it's because the kind of like the puppet sort of structure that you put inside once you have your mouse skin and you're doing uh, taxidermy. I didn't really do the best job on that, so it's all kind of weighted to one side. I, I, any kind of like crafty stuff, because I'm extremely left-handed. And any kind of crafty stuff, I'm always kind of I'll always blame the scissors, basically. Um, so I was amazed that I managed to make anything, never mind this stuffed mouse, which a few years later is on my bookcase, which makes for interesting conversations if anybody comes in my room. Or <laughs> previous flat that I lived in, I actually had him in the in the living room, and um, I had some friends around to play board games, and one of them I had to say, just so you know, there is a there is a dead mouse in the living room. So that's all right. I stuffed him. That's, that's all. So <laughs> that's I have to explain. To say, good to I, say to people. Yeah, I'm just like, let's keep dead animals, but. Um, yeah, mice are interesting. They're just well, all uh, animals are interesting because you think, oh, they're they're vermin. And they're all they're all the same. No, they're 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 not. They're, there's many many varieties yeah, yeah. of mouse. And they are lovely as well. Yeah, they are. <laughs> but actually, I had a brilliant conversation with my mum with a taxidermy thing because she was. I, I showed her a photo and she was like, "Well, that looks nice, but I wouldn't want it in my house." And I said, um, "If you were a mouse and you were dead, because these were mice that would have been fed to snakes." If you were a mouse and you were dead, would you rather be in a bin, squashed on the road, or um, stuffed and sitting in a tiny, tiny doll's house chair on someone's bookcase forever? And my mum said, if I was a mouse, I wouldn't want to die at all. <laughs> that's, a, yeah. that's a good, good, answer, good answer to that. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know if my mum believes in reincarnation, but um, she's a mouse. She's going to be around forever. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go on to uh, movies. Uh, what's, your, what's your top... Oh, the top three movies. Oh God, what put genre? On, put, yeah, put you on the spot. Um, um, well, I really like horror. Um, hence me doing a, I do a horror podcast, uh, which I will probably plug later, um, if I'm allowed to. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I'd say probably think it's like something like The Wicker Man, um, an American Werewolf in London. But I was saying that, I don't know with American Werewolf if it's just if it's genuinely good or if it's just kind of like, I saw a bit of this when I was too young to see it and it scared me, therefore it's the best horror movie ever, but it's still... Um, it's got a very abrupt ending, that's the only thing yes. I think about it. Yeah, I think that's because we're, werewolf myths tend to be just kind of like, no, it's all horrible. No, it's, I should probably choose something that's nice really for a third movie. I like When Harry Met Sally. I don't do rom-coms apart from that one. Annie Hall and a lot of like the a lot of the fifties ones with Doris Day and Rock Hudson in. So we'll go with that. 
Nice. It's nice. a lovely script. And so your so your favourite genre is is horror then? Yeah, horror and sci-fi, but um, particularly horror. Do, do you watch Do you watch much television as well? Uh, not really. No, I would rather watch. Um, I'd rather watch a film than a box set, just because I can get through if. If I sit down and watch four films in one go, I just think, well, you know, yeah, my eyeballs are sore. But if I sit down and watch five episodes of a TV show, I'm still only kind of halfway through. Yeah. There's a couple of exceptions, usually stuff people have recommended to me. Have you ever seen Patriot? No. That's on Amazon Prime, and it's basically like the Coen Brothers made a spy series. Okay. And it's absolutely brilliant. Is that with Jamie, is Jamie Bell in that? Is that the right thing I'm thinking of? I don't think so. There's a few character actors I've seen in movies and stuff but I don't think there's anyone who's particularly particularly well known in it. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's just got a really tight script and it's very funny and it's beautifully shot as well. Okay. So um, I haven't actually watched season two yet so that's... Um, I, have to, I have to check check that out then. Yeah. It takes a little while to get going but it's um, it's a good good show. Recommended. I, I get you on the whole watching a load of movies instead of watching a load of TV shows but I always have people sort of say to me oh you should, with a TV show, you get more out of the story. Mm. It's like you've got to watch, you know, over, there might be an hour long episode, yeah. another hour long episode. Mm. With a movie, I know people say, well, you might not get as much story, but I think you still get enough story out of a movie. <laughs> the same amount as a, as a TV show. Yeah. Also, I don't know if you find this, but with documentaries on Netflix, there's a lot of them, but there's all they're always too long. Yeah. yeah. So something like uh, Making a Murderer or um, Wild, what's the one with the, the cult in it? Wild Wild Country. Yeah. Those are really interesting. But they are two hour documentaries stretched out to eight hours. So every time, because I did, um, I think the first series of Making a Murder was not long not long after I, Murderer, I should say, not Making a Murder, that's something, <laughs> isn't it? I don't know what that is. Um, after I moved into my current flat, me and my flatmate were kind of coordinating on watching it. And um, usually it would get to the courtroom scenes and Simon, my flatmate, would fall asleep. <laughs> And what was lovely was there was always a security guard in the background of the courtroom scenes, and he'd fall asleep too. So it's just like, <laughs> okay, this is a sign that there's, there's too much of this series. Yeah, yeah. Though oh, also, Bojack Horseman, that's another yeah, reason. Bojack Horseman is, I love that show great. so much. I think they're doing another, I think they're bringing out another season mm. this year. Which, which yes, is they are. I don't understand how they managed to get it out so quickly, because the animation with animation takes forever. But it's yeah, beautiful, yeah. it's really, not only is it an animated series, it's really well done. Love it. No, it's great. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really good at segues with this. I never, I never know how to segue with people. Mm. Uh, Pulled it out. I always find that's good. Comics. Do you read? Mm. Do you read comics? Yes, I do. <laughs> not, not read or just, or just well. books or any, com This can be comics and books. Oh God, that's mostly that. That's the description of most of my um, my bedroom floor. Um, <laughs> I tend to get graphic novels rather than comics, just go sort of like the the, tr the collected collected editions, but. Um, what have I been reading recently? Um, I really like The Wicked and Divine. Have you read that? Um, I, is, the, is it where the cover... I've, I've never read it, but I know the cover's like a weird upside down. The titles go upside down almost. Yeah, I think that's right. They've, they've, they've got, it's very... The sort of cover The cover art is very, very striking, and they tend to have guest artists doing yeah, yeah. it. But that's... it's The premise is that every... I think it's every 80 years or so... A load of gods are reborn as people, and they tend to be young people, and they're brilliant and amazing, and they they basically worship like rock stars, and some of them are rock stars, and some of them are DJs for a few years, and then they just have to die. So it's all about kind of hedonism and choices, and sort of people with spooky powers screwing each other over. Um, it's um, it's very very good, and the same people that did that also did one called Phonogram, okay, which is um, about it's about people that are, that use magic via music and the first volume of that was very focused on kind of 90s indie so I read that and I always felt kind of odd because it was just like not only is this stuff that I remember listening to when I was younger but this also it kind of resonates in a very um, significant way what it's like to be in love with what you're listening to and I think with um, with comics and graphic novels when they're good they kind of hit you in the way that pretty much no other art form does. Yeah, yeah. I get you that. It's like the Sandman, the um, Neil Gaiman situation. Yeah. I originally read completely out of sequence because my local library had it when I was younger, but I just kind of get whatever volume was in there. There's a couple of just single frames from that that are kind of absolutely burned on my memory, and some of them still give me nightmares. 
I think they were meant to be, they're meant to be doing a TV series of the oh, Sandman at one point. I hope but, they don't get it wrong. But yeah, I haven't, I haven't really heard much more about that, but I know Neil Gunn, was, he wanted to do something mm. with it, but... They just done Good Omens as a TV series, that's not okay. out yet, but that should be quite good. Yeah. Any other, any other comics you've uh, read? Paper Girls is a good series. I was like, that was when you started talking about Walking Divine, yeah, that's what I was, I was getting sort of reminded of. Yeah, that's kind of got a similar vibe to Stranger Things, but in a different different way, different pace. You up to date on all of Not yet, no. I've just read number five and that was, yeah. Yeah, I think I got as far as three, so I've got two. I always tend to be like a couple of volumes behind yeah. on everything. I've got a couple of the, the Wicked and Divine that I need to check out, but... um. I try to avoid going in comic shops just because it's very, very easy to spend all your money in one go. <laughs> I, will, um, I will browse for a long time. You know, the Paper Girls, I thought, I thought it was a, it's a well, like, interesting one. Mm. Um, and I was, I found it weird with the, the god that is in there. Mm -hmm. He wears Public Enemy and like, yeah, and Wu Tang Clan T-shirts. That is quite weird. But they don't really ever speak about why he's, he's dressed like that. Mm. But no, no, that's a, that's a good, a good one. Uh, I've the the next thing is uh, other things. Try right, other things, just in case you want to talk about. Is there any other things? Uh, oh God, you what, like what sort of other things? Um, just anything. It can be anything you want to talk about. Um, we'll talk about books, but then again, I just I will read anything and everything. And um, reading quite a lot of um, Terry Pratchett at the moment. Um, and I've got a feeling I'm going to soon reread some Dickens. I did a I did a literature degree, so every now and then, <laughs> as did a couple of my colleagues. So earlier on, rather than talk, rather than doing work, we were um, well, we were doing work, but we looked at it and went, "Oh, this is impossible." So we looked at like the best hundred novels ever, and um, my one of my colleagues said, um, and I quote, "Oh, a farewell to arms is absolutely banging." I'm just like, "No, I don't like Hemingway." You don't like. Uh, Ernest Hemingway. I've not read enough of him, but there's a certain. He just, get, he just gets quoted in too many. There's a certain films as well. Yeah, there's a certain stripe of American author where you read their stuff and you just kind of have to go, yeah, I like that, but shame about the misogyny, <laughs> which could basically apply to everything. Yeah, no, I get you with the some of his books are quite weird. Yeah, but it's the, the those times. As yeah, well. exactly, exactly. But then um, I did a I did a comment. Have you seen me do my HP Lovecraft stuff? Probably not because there's literally only two people that like it. I did a show in I was I did a guest spot at a show in Edinburgh, a compilation show that was all about books called Book Lovers Comedy, and that was a lot of fun. But at one point I did say, um, "Has anybody read any HP Lovecraft?" And it was just silence. But Lovecraft, amazing imagination, gets quoted everywhere. Inspiration between behind so many good things like the thing. I've like half the DVDs I can see on your bookshelf. You've got Society up there as well, which is a banging film. The the point that I made in the, the Lovecraft stuff is that he was such a massive racist and sexist that in the nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties, that the other uh, other uh, racists and sexists would look at his work and go a bit much, <laughs> bit much, mate. Yeah, there's a. Um... In the, in the South Park game, the uh, newest one, mm. they had that there was a HP Lovecraft um, creature in there mm. that was a massive racist that would eat just eat people. Yeah, yeah, he was, <laughs> it was it was very odd. But it's, it's surprising to hear you say that you did you asked if anyone liked HP Lovecraft and a thing called book lovers. They it weren't was, into genre silent. stuff. You yeah. find that some people are just like, oh no, that's that's not real. That's the, what, yeah, what stuff? Is what, what are you? Sorry, what are you reading? <laughs> Did you? What other books were people talking about? Uh, this was one of those places where it was so small I couldn't actually get to see anyone else's set because the actual performance space was in a karaoke booth. <laughs> it was great. Oh, those karaoke, yeah. Sometimes the karaoke booths can be massive. Or this one wasn't. Yeah. Um, that was that was a nice gig though. I did all my. Um, I did. I did slag off some sexist American writers, and I did um, did my Moby Dick stuff, which people seem to like. So. Yeah, your Moby Dick stuff is is good. I actually got a <laughs> I got a Moby Dick related heckle when I did that in Oxford. Oh, okay. What was the What was the heckle? Well, I I did the bit, and then I said, "You guys are probably thinking, oh God, why did she go for Moby Dick? That is such an obvious Melville novel to choose.'" And this Amer this very nice American guy shouted. I would prefer not to. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're, you're quoting uh, Bartleby the Scrivener. 
That's not a novel though, it's a novella. <laughs> and I was like, just try to work out which one of us is more pretentious. <laughs> it's always good when you get heckles like that, but them trying to be sort of clever. Yeah. Uh, so um, this this year, I'm gonna, you're, you're doing a Brighton show, aren't you? I am, yeah. And are you just doing the one? I'm doing the one, the one date. date there, and then I'm going to try and do a couple of dates at Camden. I'm just waiting for, well, I'm waiting for, for a couple of things. I'm waiting for my artwork for Brighton to be done, because it's going to be really good. Then I need to pay the guy that's doing my artwork, <laughs> and then I need to pay for Camden. So it's, it's your first time doing a solo show, yes, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Are, you, are you ready for, well, I'm guessing you've been going for like, you've been going three years, she said. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm panicking a bit, but I think it's time to at least give it a go. Is it doing... No, some new material. I'm going to write some new stuff and then put. I know people do things differently. Some people will kind of do a show that's like all their best stuff. Yeah. Um. But I, what I want to do is something that's more kind of narrative based. But I will put in sort of tried and tested stuff if it works. That's my plan at the moment. Yeah, that's what I think. That's what what I did with my show before. It was mm. it was just some stuff that I know, but just trying. It's fun to just go out there with a whole yeah new show and not really know how it's going to go. Um. How and on me, we've, we've gone through this very fast, this, mm. this list. How and on me on this is, uh, is there three things you want to recommend anyone? Just not three things, just anything you want to recommend <laughs> people. You, you said about, yeah, this is the point where you can plug your, your podcast, you uh, yeah. about your show, or and okay. anything people want to watch, <laughs> read. Um, just read, that's all I can, no, I'm not going to be, <laughs> even I'm not going to, just read books, everybody. So you hear people going, young people don't read anymore. It's like, they're on the internet, they're reading all the time. <laughs> Admittedly, they're all reading about how Tony in Form B is an arsehole or whatever, but they are at least... Still, still reading. <laughs> yeah. That's a really terrible thing, because you'd just be like, going, oh, well, at least, at least he's engaging with people. That's some <laughs> horrible edgelord that's writing really unpleasant things on the internet. On, on the forums. Oh, God. <laughs> forums of doom. Anyway, uh, don't don't go on internet forums unless they're nice ones. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, just, quite, that's quite hard to just, find. Just life advice at the moment. Uh, what would I recommend to people? Um, well, okay, I will plug the podcast that I do with um, some other comedians and some horror fans. It's called Devil Times Five. You can get that on uh, iTunes or wherever. Uh, with the last one we recorded, we discussed the entire Saw franchise. And by the end, we went completely demented. We all went completely demented because there's three. Basically, there were two guys that really liked it, and like one of them was the guy that edits the podcast, Cliff. And he, you know, he's like, "This is my favourite movie series ever." And there's a lot of Saw movies. <laughs> and oh my god, so it was like I think by the end, I just I don't know what 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 was going on. I'm always tempted to listen back to it. How he edited it down to an hour and a half, I don't know, but check that out. But we've done other episodes, so we are all enthusiasts as well as just mucking about and being slightly slightly rude and extremely silly but it's um it's a well well put together um podcast so it's not put together by me i don't have any, uh, the yes, so. editing skills but <laughs> okay go and listen to that then and uh, what's the name of your show at? uh my show is called impish uh which came about because i had this idea well it works. I had to be. I'm just. I just sound like suits corner out of private eye today. Because it works on several levels. But there's the whole idea of the imp of the perverse, the thing that makes you do stuff that you know that you shouldn't do. Um, there's also a 17th century woodcut that I like of a witch introduced, supposedly introducing her familiars, and they've all got completely mad names. And then you've got one. It's called Vinegar Tom, and it's like some sort of cat type thing. Um, it's just it, the idea is it's about having a weird imagination when you're doing ordinary boring stuff and how that can be both brilliant and not a good idea so that's that's the premise for my show and um what was i gonna what's gonna recommend? yeah patriot watch that it's um it's really good i've ended this very i, I was i never know how to end this and i feel like i've ended it really awkwardly mm. just with the the silence <laughs> thank, thank you <laughs> thank you for being on this on the coffee vlog today and thank speaking you. about uh, go and see Emily's show at the Brighton Fringe and listen to her podcast as well. Oh, the, the show's at the, on the 9th of May. Yeah, 9th of May. 9th of May? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Why, I don't know why I thought it was March. No, it's May. May. Yeah, it's 9th of May. Go I and, hope it's not March because I'm going to get shocked. Go and see that at the Brighton <laughs> Fringe and that's all for today. Uh, thank Cheers. you, guys. Bye. See you on the next one. <laughs>